Roughing It in the Bush by Susanna Moody. Chapter 15, Part 1. The Wilderness and Our Indian Friends. Man of strange race, stern dweller of the wild, nature's free-born, untamed and daring child. The clouds of the preceding night, instead of dissolving in snow, brought on a rapid thaw. A thaw in the middle of winter is the most disagreeable change that can be imagined. After several weeks of clear, bright, bracing, frosty weather, with a serene atmosphere and cloudless sky, you awake one morning, surprised at the change in the temperature, and, upon looking out of the window, behold the woods obscured by a murky haze, not so dense as an English November fog, but more black and lowering, and the heavens shrouded in a uniform covering of leaden-coloured clouds, deepening into a livid indigo at the edge of the horizon. The snow, no longer hard and glittering, has become soft and spongy, and the foot slips into a wet and insidiously yielding mass at every step. From the roof pours down a continuous stream of water, and the branches of the trees, collecting the moisture of the reeking atmosphere, shower it upon the earth from every dripping twig. The cheerless and uncomfortable aspect of things without never fails to produce a corresponding effect upon the minds of those within, and casts such a damp upon the spirits that it appears to destroy for a time all sense of enjoyment. Many persons, and myself among the number, are made aware of the approach of a thunderstorm by an intense pain and weight about the head, and I have heard numbers of Canadians complain that a thaw always made them feel bilious and heavy, and greatly depressed their animal spirits. I had a great desire to visit our new location, but when I looked out upon the cheerless waste, I gave up the idea, and contented myself with hoping for a better day on the morrow. But many morrows came and went before a frost again hardened the road sufficiently for me to make the attempt. The prospect from the windows of my sister's log hut was not very prepossessing. The small lake in front, which formed such a pretty object in summer, now looked like an extensive field covered with snow, hemmed in from the rest of the world by a dark belt of sombre pine woods. The clearing round the house was very small, and only just reclaimed from the wilderness, and the greater part of it covered with piles of brushwood to be burnt the first dry days of spring. The charred and blackened stumps on the few acres that had been cleared during the preceding year were everything but picturesque, and I concluded as I turned, disgusted from the prospect before me, that there was very little beauty to be found in the backwoods. But I came to this decision during a Canadian thaw, be it remembered, when one is wont to view every object with jaundiced eyes. Moody had only been able to secure sixty-six acres of his government grant upon the upper Cachawanook Lake, which, being interpreted, means in English, the Lake of the Waterfalls, a very poetical meaning which most Indian names have. He had, however, secured a clergy reserve of two hundred acres adjoining, and he afterwards purchased a fine lot, which likewise formed part of the same block, one hundred acres for a hundred and fifty pounds. This was an enormously high price for wild land, but the prospect of opening the Trent and Autonomie for the navigation of steamboats and other small craft was at that period a favourite speculation, and its practicability and the great advantages to be derived from it were so widely believed as to raise the value of the wild lands along these remote waters to an enormous price and settlers in the vicinity were eager to secure lots at any sacrifice along their shores. After a lapse of fifteen years, we had been glad to sell these lots of land, after considerable clearings had been made upon them, for less than they originally cost us. Our government grant was upon the lake shore, and Moody had chosen for the site of his log house a bank that sloped gradually from the edge of the water, until it attained to the dignity of a hill. Along the top of this ridge the forest road ran, and midway down the hill our humble home, already nearly completed, stood, surrounded by the eternal forest. A few trees had been cleared in its immediate vicinity, just sufficient to allow the workmen to proceed, and to prevent the fall of any tree injuring the building, or the danger of its taking fire during the process of burning the fallow. 
a neighbour had undertaken to build this rude dwelling by contract, and was to have it ready for us by the first week in the new year. The want of boards to make the divisions in the apartments alone hindered him from fulfilling his contract. These had lately been procured, and the house was ready for our reception in the course of a week. Our trunks and baggage had already been conveyed thither by Mr. D., and, in spite of my sister's kindness and hospitality, I longed to find myself once more settled in a home of my own. The day after our arrival, I was agreeably surprised by a visit from Monaghan, whom Moody had once more taken into his service. The poor fellow was delighted that his nurse-child, as he always called little Katie, had not forgotten him, but evinced the most lively satisfaction at the sight of her dark friend. Early every morning, Moody went off to the house, and the first fine day my sister undertook to escort me through the wood to inspect it. The proposal was joyfully accepted, and although I felt rather timid when I found myself with only my female companion in the vast forest, I kept my fears to myself, lest I should be laughed at. This foolish dread of encountering wild beasts in the woods I never could wholly shake off, even after becoming a constant resident in their gloomy depths, and accustomed to follow the forest path alone or attended with little children daily. The cracking of an old bow or the hooting of the owl was enough to fill me with alarm, and try my strength in a precipitate flight. Often I have stopped and reproached myself for want of faith in the goodness of Providence, and repeated the text, The wicked are afraid when no man pursueth, but the righteous are as bold as a lion, as if to shame myself into courage. But it would not do. I could not overcome the weakness of the flesh. If I had one of my infants with me, the wish to protect the child from any danger which might beset my path gave me for a time a fictitious courage, but it was like love fighting with despair. It was in vain that my husband assured me that no person had ever been attacked by wild animals in the woods, that a child might traverse them even at night in safety. Whilst I knew that wild animals existed in those woods, I could not believe him, and my fears on this head rather increased than diminished. The snow had been so greatly decreased by the late thaw that it had been converted into a coating of ice, which afforded a dangerous and slippery footing. My sister, who had resided for nearly twelve months in the woods, was provided for her walk with Indian moccasins, which rendered her quite independent. But I stumbled at every step. The sun shone brightly, the air was clear and invigorating, and, in spite of the treacherous ground and my foolish fears, I greatly enjoyed my first walk in the woods. Naturally of a cheerful, hopeful disposition, my sister was enthusiastic in her admiration of the woods. She drew such a lively picture of the charms of a summer residence in the forest that I began to feel greatly interested in her descriptions and to rejoice that we, too, were to be her near neighbours and dwellers in the woods. And this circumstance not a little reconciled me to the change. Hoping that my husband would derive an income equal to the one he had parted with from the investment of the price of his commission in the steamboat stock, I felt no dread of want. Our legacy of seven hundred pounds had afforded us means to purchase land, build our house, and give out a large portion of land to be cleared and, with a considerable sum of money still in hand, our prospects for the future were in no way discouraging. When we reached the top of the ridge that overlooked our cot, my sister stopped, and pointed out a log house among the trees. "'There, S,' she said, "'is your home. When that black cedar swamp is cleared away, that now hides the lake from us, you will have a very pretty view.' My conversation with her had quite altered the aspect of the country, and predisposed me to view things in the most favourable light. I found Moody and Monaghan employed in piling up heaps of bush near the house, which they intended to burn off by hand previous to firing the rest of the fallow, to prevent any risk to the building from fire. The house was made of cedar logs, and presented a superior air of comfort to most dwellings of the same kind. The dimensions were thirty-six feet in length and thirty-two in breadth, which gave us a nice parlour, a kitchen, and two small bedrooms, which were divided by plank partitions. Pantry or storeroom there was none, some rough shelves in the kitchen, and a deal cupboard in a corner of the parlour being the extent of our accommodations in that way. 
Our servant, Mary Tate, was busy scrubbing out the parlour and bedroom, but the kitchen and the sleeping-room off it were still knee-deep in chips, and filled with the carpenter's bench and tools and all our luggage. Such as it was, it was a palace when compared to old Satan's log hut, or the miserable cabin we had wintered in during the severe winter of 1833, and I regarded it with complacency as my future home. While we were standing outside the building, conversing with my husband, a young gentleman of the name of Morgan, who had lately purchased land in that vicinity, went into the kitchen to light his pipe at the stove, and, with true backwood carelessness, let the hot cinder fall among the dry chips that strewed the floor. A few minutes later the whole mass was in a blaze, and it was not without great difficulty that Moody and Mr. R. succeeded in putting out the fire. Thus we were nearly deprived of our home before we had taken up our abode in it. The indifference to the danger of fire, in a country where most of the dwellings are composed of inflammable materials, is truly astonishing. Accustomed to see enormous fires blazing on every hearthstone, and to sleep in front of these fires, his bedding often ridden with holes made by hot particles of wood flying out during the night, and igniting beneath his very nose, the sturdy backwoodsman never dreads an enemy in the element that he is used to regard as his best friend. Yet what awful accidents, what ruinous calamities arise out of this criminal negligence both to himself and others! A few days after this adventure we bade adieu to my sister, and took possession of our new dwelling, and commenced a life in the woods. The first spring we spent in comparative ease and idleness. Our cows had been left upon our old place during the winter. The ground had to be cleared before it could receive a crop of any kind, and I had little to do but to wander by the lake shore or among the woods and amuse myself. These were the halcyon days of the bush. My husband had purchased a very light cedar canoe, to which he attached a keel and a sail, and most of our leisure hours, directly the snows melted, were spent upon the water. These fishing and shooting excursions were delightful. The pure beauty of the Canadian water, the sombre but august grandeur of the vast forest that hemmed us in on every side, and shut us out from the rest of the world, soon cast a magic spell upon our spirits and we began to feel charmed with the freedom and solitude around us. Every object was new to us. We felt as if we were the first discoverers of every beautiful flower and stately tree that attracted our attention, and we gave names to fantastic rocks and fairy isles, and raised imaginary houses and bridges on every picturesque spot which we floated past during our aquatic excursions. I learned the use of the paddle, and became quite a proficient in the gentle craft. It was not long before we received visits from the Indians, a people whose beauty, talents, and good qualities have been somewhat overrated, and invested with a poetical interest which they scarcely deserve. Their honesty and love of truth are the finest traits in characters otherwise dark and unlovely. But these are two godlike attributes, and from them spring all that is generous and ennobling about them. There never was a people more sensible of kindness, or more grateful for any little act of benevolence exercised towards them. We met them with confidence, our dealings with them were conducted with the strictest integrity, and they became attached to our persons, and in no single instance ever destroyed the good opinion we entertained of them. The tribes that occupy the shores of all these inland waters, back of the Great Lakes, belong to the Chippewa or Mississauga Indians perhaps the least attractive of all these wild people, both with regard to their physical and mental endowments. The men of this tribe are generally small of stature, with very coarse and repulsive features. The forehead is low and retreating, the observing faculties large, the intellectual ones scarcely developed, the ears large and standing off from the face, the eyes looking towards the temples, keen, snake-like, and far apart the cheekbones prominent, the nose long and flat, the nostrils very round, the jawbone projecting, massy and brutal, the mouth expressing ferocity and sullen determination, the teeth large, even, and dazzlingly white. The mouth of the female differs widely in expression from that of the male. The lips are fuller, the jaw less projecting, and the smile is simple and agreeable. 
the women are a merry, light-hearted set, and their constant laugh and incessant prattle form a strange contrast to the iron taciturnity of their grim lords. Now I am upon the subject, I will recapitulate a few traits and sketches of these people, as they came under my own immediate observation. A dry cedar swamp, not far from the house by the lake shore, had been their usual place of encampment for many years. The whole block of land was almost entirely covered with maple trees, and had originally been an Indian sugar bush. Although the favorite spot had now passed into the hands of strangers, they still frequented the place to make canoes and baskets, to fish and shoot, and occasionally to follow their old occupation. Scarcely a week passed away without my being visited by the dark strangers, and as my husband never allowed them to eat with the servants, who viewed them with the same horror that Mrs. D. did Black Molyneux, but brought them to his own table, they soon grew friendly and communicative, and would point to every object that attracted their attention, asking a thousand questions as to its use, the material of which it was made, and if we were inclined to exchange it for their commodities. With a large map of Canada they were infinitely delighted. In a moment they recognized every bay and headland in Ontario, and almost screamed with delight when, following the course of the Trent with their fingers, they came to their own lake. How eagerly each pointed out the spot to his fellows! How intently their black heads were bent down, and their dark eyes fixed upon the map! What strange, uncouth exclamations of surprise burst from their lips, as they rapidly repeated the Indian names for every lake and river on this wonderful piece of paper. The old chief, Peter Nogan, begged hard for the coveted treasure. He would give canoe, venison, duck, fish for it, and more by and by. I felt sorry that I was unable to gratify his wishes, but the map had cost upwards of six dollars, and was daily consulted by my husband in reference to the names and situations of localities in the neighborhood. I had in my possession a curious Japanese sword, which had been given to me by an uncle of Tom Wilson's, a strange gift to a young lady, but it was on account of its curiosity, and had no reference to my warlike propensities. This sword was broad and three-sided in the blade, and in shape resembled a moving snake. The hilt was formed of a hideous carved image of one of their war-gods, and a more villainous-looking wretch was never conceived by the most distorted imagination. He was represented in a sitting attitude, the eagle's claws that formed his hands resting upon his knees. His legs terminated in lion's paws, and his face was a strange compound of beast and bird, the upper part of his person being covered with feathers, the lower with long, shaggy hair. The case of this awful weapon was made of wood, and, in spite of its serpentine form, fitted it exactly. No trace of a join could be found in this scabbard, which was of hard wood and highly polished. One of my Indian friends found this sword lying upon the bookshelf, and he hurried to communicate the important discovery to his companions. Moody was absent, and they brought it to me to demand an explanation of the figure that formed the hilt. I told them that it was a weapon that belonged to a very fierce people who lived in the east, far over the great salt lake that they were not Christians as we were, but said their prayers to images made of silver and gold and ivory and wood, and that this was one of them, that before they went into battle they said their prayers to that hideous thing, which they had made with their own hands. The Indians were highly amused by this relation, and passed the sword from one to the other, exclaiming, A god! Og! A god! But in spite of these outward demonstrations of contempt, I was sorry to perceive that this circumstance gave the weapon a great value in their eyes, and they regarded it with a sort of mysterious awe. For several days they continued to visit the house, bringing along with them some fresh companion to look at Mrs. Moody's god, until, vexed and annoyed by the delight they manifested at the sight of the eagle-beaked monster, I refused to gratify their curiosity by not producing him again. The manufacture of the sheath which had caused me much perplexity, was explained by old Peter in a minute. "'Tis burnt out,' he said. Instrument made like sword. Heat red-hot, burnt through, polished outside. Had I demanded a whole fleet of canoes for my Japanese sword, 
I am certain they would have agreed to the bargain. The Indian possesses great taste, which is displayed in the carving of his paddles, in the shape of his canoes, in the elegance and symmetry of his bows, in the cut of his leggings and moccasins, the sheath of his hunting-knife, and in all the little ornaments in which he delights. It is almost impossible for a settler to imitate to perfection an Indian's cherry-wood paddle. My husband made very creditable attempts, but still there was something wanting. The elegance of the Indian finish was not there. If you show them a good print, they invariably point out the most natural and the best executed figure in the group. They are particularly delighted with pictures, examine them long and carefully, and seem to feel an artist-like pleasure in observing the effect produced by light and shade. I had been showing John Nogan, the eldest son of old Peter, some beautiful coloured engravings of celebrated females. To my astonishment he pounced upon the best, and grunted out his admiration in the most approved Indian fashion. After having looked for a long time at all the pictures very attentively, he took his dog Sancho upon his knee, and showed him the pictures, with as much gravity as if the animal really could have shared in his pleasure. The vanity of these grave men is highly amusing. They seem perfectly unconscious of it themselves, and it is exhibited in the most childlike manner. Peter and his son John were taking tea with us, when we were joined by my brother, Mr. S. The latter was giving us an account of the marriage of Peter Jones, the celebrated Indian preacher. "'I cannot think,' he said, "'how any lady of property and education could marry such a man as Jones. Why, he's as ugly as Peter here.' This was said, not with any idea of insulting the redskin on the score of his beauty, of which he possessed not the smallest particle, but in total forgetfulness that our guest understood English. Never shall I forget the red flash of that fierce dark eye as it glared upon my unconscious brother. I would not have received such a fiery glance for all the wealth that Peter Jones obtained with his Saxon bride. John Nogan was highly amused by his father's indignation. He hid his face behind the chief, and though he kept perfectly still, his whole frame was convulsed with suppressed laughter. A plainer human being than poor Peter could scarcely be imagined yet he certainly deemed himself handsome. I am inclined to think that their ideas of personal beauty differ very widely from ours. Tom Nogan, the chief's brother, had a very large, fat, ugly squaw for his wife. She was a mountain of tawny flesh, and, but for the innocent, good-natured expression which, like a bright sunbeam penetrating a swarthy cloud, spread all around a kindly glow, she might have been termed hideous. This woman they considered very handsome, calling her a fine squaw, clever squaw, a much good woman. Though in what her superiority consisted, I never could discover, often as I visited the wigwam. She was very dirty, and appeared quite indifferent to the claims of common decency, in the disposal of the few filthy rags that covered her. She was, however, very expert in all Indian craft. No Jew could drive a better bargain than Mrs. Tom and her urchins, of whom she was the happy mother of five or six, were as cunning and avaricious as herself. One day she visited me, bringing along with her a very pretty covered basket for sale. I asked her what she wanted for it, but could obtain from her no satisfactory answer. I showed her a small piece of silver. She shook her head. I tempted her with pork and flour, but she required neither. I had just given up the idea of dealing with her in despair when she suddenly seized upon me, and, lifting up my gown, pointed exultingly to my quilted petticoat, clapping her hands and laughing immoderately. Another time she led me all over the house to show me what she wanted in exchange for basket. My patience was well-nigh exhausted in following her from place to place, in her attempt to discover the coveted article, when, hanging upon a peg in my chamber, she espied a pair of trousers belonging to my husband's logging suit. The riddle was solved. With a joyful cry she pointed to them, exclaiming, "'Take basket! Give them!' It was with no small difficulty that I rescued the indispensables from her grasp. From this woman I learned a story of Indian coolness and courage, which made a deep impression on my mind. One of their squaws, a near relation of her own, 
had accompanied her husband on a hunting expedition into the forest. He had been very successful, and having killed more deer than they could well carry home, he went to the house of a white man to dispose of some of it, leaving the squaw to take care of the rest until his return. She sat carelessly upon the log, with his hunting-knife in her hand, when she heard the breaking of branches near her, and turning round, beheld a great bear only a few paces from her. It was too late to retreat, and seeing that the animal was very hungry, and determined to come to close quarters, she rose and placed her back against a small tree, holding her knife close to her breast, and in a straight line with the bear. The shaggy monster came on. She remained motionless, her eyes steadily fixed upon her enemy, and as his huge arms closed around her, she slowly drove the knife into his heart. The bear uttered a hideous cry, and sank dead at her feet. When the Indian returned, he found the courageous woman taking the skin from the carcass of the formidable brute. What iron nerves these people must possess, when even a woman could dare and do a deed like this! The wolf they hold in great contempt, and scarcely deign to consider him as an enemy. Peter Nogan assured me that he never was near enough to one in his life to shoot it, that, except in large companies, and when greatly pressed by hunger, they rarely attack men. They hold the lynx or wolverine in much dread, as they often spring from trees upon their prey, fastening upon the throat with their sharp teeth and claws, from which a person in the dark could scarcely free himself without first receiving a dangerous wound. The cry of this animal is very terrifying, resembling the shrieks of a human creature in mortal agony. My husband was anxious to collect some of the native Indian airs, as they all sing well and have a fine ear for music, but all his efforts proved abortive. John, he said to young Nogan, who played very creditably on the flute, and had just concluded the popular air of Sweet Home. Cannot you play me one of your own songs? Yes, but no good. Leave me to be the judge of that. Cannot you give me a war song? Yes, but no good, with an ominous shake of the head. A hunting song? No fit for white man, with an air of contempt. No good, no good. Do, John, sing us a love song, said I, laughing, if you have such a thing in your language. Oh, much love song, very much. Bad, bad. No good for Christian man. Indian song no good for white ears. This was very tantalizing, as their songs sounded very sweetly from the lips of their squaws, and I had a great desire and curiosity to get some of them rendered into English. To my husband they gave the name of the musician, but I have forgotten the Indian word. It signified the maker of sweet sounds. They listened with intense delight to the notes of his flute, maintaining a breathless silence during the performance, their dark eyes flashing into fierce light at a martial strain, or softening with the plaintive and tender. The cunning which they display in their contests with their enemies, in their hunting, and in making bargains with the whites, who are too apt to impose on their ignorance, seems to spring more from a law of necessity forced upon them by their isolated position and precarious mode of life, than from any innate wish to betray. The Indian's face, after all, is a perfect index of his mind. The eye chances its expression with every impulse and passion, and shows what is passing within as clearly as the lightning in a dark night betrays the course of the stream. I cannot think that deceit forms any prominent trait in the Indian's character. They invariably act with the strictest honour towards those who never attempt to impose upon them. It is natural for a deceitful person to take advantage of the credulity of others. The genuine Indian never utters a falsehood, and never employs flattery, that powerful weapon in the hands of the insidious, in his communications with the whites. His worst traits are those which he has in common with the wild animals of the forest and which his intercourse with the lowest order of civilized men, who in point of moral worth are greatly his inferiors, and the pernicious effects of strong drink, have greatly tended to inflame and debate. It is a melancholy truth, and deeply to be lamented, that the vicinity of European settlers has always produced a very demoralizing effect upon the Indians. As a proof of this I will relate a simple anecdote. John, of Rice Lake, a very sensible middle-aged Indian, was conversing with me about their language, and the difficulty he found in understanding the books written in Indian for their use. 
Among other things, I asked him if his people ever swore, or used profane language towards the deity. The man regarded me with a sort of stern horror as he replied, "'Indian, till after he knew your people, never swore. No bad word in Indian. Indian must learn your words to swear, and take God's name in vain.' Oh, what a reproof to Christian men! I felt abashed and degraded in the eyes of this poor savage, who, ignorant as he was in many respects, yet possessed that first great attribute of the soul, a deep reverence for the Supreme Being. How inferior were thousands of my countrymen to him in this important point! The affection of Indian parents to their children, and the deference which they pay to the aged, is another beautiful and touching trait in their character. One extremely cold, wintry day, as I was huddled with my little ones over the stove, the door softly unclosed, and the moccasined foot of an Indian crossed the floor. I raised my head, for I was too much accustomed to their sudden appearance at any hour to feel alarmed, and perceived a tall woman standing silently and respectfully before me, wrapped in a large blanket. The moment she caught my eye, she dropped the folds of her covering from around her, and laid at my feet the attenuated figure of a boy, about twelve years of age, who was in the last stage of consumption. "'Papoose die,' she said, mournfully clasping her hands against her breast, and looking down upon the suffering lad with the most heartfelt expression of maternal love, while large tears trickled down her dark face. "'Moody squaw, save Papoose!' Poor Indian woman much glad. Her child was beyond all human aid. I looked anxiously upon him, and knew by the pinched-up features and purple hue of his wasted cheek that he had not many hours to live. I could only answer with tears her agonizing appeal to my skill. Try and save him. All die but him. She held up five of her fingers brought him all the way from Muta Lake upon my back for white squaw to cure. Mud Lake, or Lake Shemong in Indian. I cannot cure him, my poor friend. He is in God's care. In a few hours he will be with him. The child was seized with a dreadful fit of coughing, which I expected every moment would terminate his frail existence. I gave him a teaspoonful of currant jelly, which he took with avidity, but could not retain a moment on his stomach. "'Papoose die!' murmured the poor woman. "'Alone, alone. No papoose. The mother all alone.' She began readjusting the poor sufferer in her blanket. I got her some food, and begged her to stay and rest herself, but she was too much distressed to eat, and too restless to remain. She said little, but her face expressed the keenest anguish. She took up her mournful load, pressed for a moment his wasted, burning hand in hers, and left the room. My heart followed her a long way on her melancholy journey. Think what this woman's love must have been for that dying son, when she had carried a lad of his age six miles through the deep snow upon her back, on such a day, in the hope of my being able to do him some good. Poor heartbroken mother! I learned from Joe Muskrat's squaw some days after that the boy died a few minutes after Elizabeth Iron, his mother, got home. They never forget any little act of kindness. One cold night, late in the fall, my hospitality was demanded by six squaws, and puzzled I was how to accommodate them all. I at last determined to give them the use of the parlor floor during the night. Among these women there was one very old whose hair was as white as snow. She was the only grey-haired Indian I ever saw, and on that account I regarded her with peculiar interest. I knew that she was the wife of a chief, by the scarlet embroidered leggings which only the wives and daughters of chiefs are allowed to wear. The old squaw had a very pleasing countenance, but I tried in vain to draw her into conversation. She evidently did not understand me, and the muskrat squaw and Betty Cow were laughing at my attempts to draw her out. I administered supper to them with my own hands, and after I had satisfied their wants, which is no very easy task, for they have great appetites, I told our servant to bring in several spare mattresses and blankets for their use. "'Now mind, Jenny, and give the old squaw the best bed,' I said. 
The others are young, and can put up with a little inconvenience. The old Indian glanced at me with her keen, bright eye, but I had no idea that she comprehended what I said. Some weeks after this, as I was sweeping over my parlour floor, a slight tap drew me to the door. On opening it I perceived the old squaw, who immediately slipped into my hand a set of beautifully embroidered bark trays, fitting one within the other, and exhibiting the very best sample of the porcupine quill-work. While I stood wondering what this might mean, the good old creature fell upon my neck, and kissing me exclaimed, "'You remember, old squaw? Make her comfortable. Old squaw, no forget you. Keep them for her sake.' And before I could detain her she ran down the hill, with a swiftness which seemed to bid defiance to years. I never saw this interesting Indian again, and I concluded that she died during the winter, for she must have been of a great age. End of chapter 15, part 1